Welcome back to the Movie Recap. Today's movie will be a 2006 war drama thriller film titled Black Book. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. The movie begins with people coming down from the service bus for a tour. In the classroom, kids sing a song with their teacher. As a lady takes a photo of the class for privacy purposes, Rachel, a school teacher, rolls down the door's blinds. However, the girl who took the photo was Ronnie, a friend from The Hague during World War II, at Kibbutz Stein in Israel in 1956. Rachel asks Ronnie's reasons why she is at school. Ronnie said that she was here because of his husband's religion tour. Not long after, Ronnie departs as they're only given a couple of minutes to do a quick visit at the school. After Ronnie left, Rachel mused about her experiences during the war's final days back in 1944. Rachel hides from the Nazis on a farm in rural Holland in 1944. They want her to study Bible scriptures in return for hiding her. Except for Rachel, everyone in the farmhouse is killed one day when a downed Allied bomber drops its payload on it. A young man from a nearby farm named Rob hides her in the greenhouse owned by the family. At the dining table, Rachel is asked to lead the meal prayer as her boss assumes that she already knows quite a few Jewish languages. A man is sailing a boat when he sees Rachel. He yelled to Rachel, saying English music is forbidden except for girls like her that are naked. The man yelling scared Rachel because she thought that it was a kraut. When Rachel was about to go on the boat, they heard screeches from the jet about to come at them. The jet releases a bomb in front of them and on the nearby house where Rachel stays. After the bombing, Rachel stayed somewhere else with Rob. They were preparing food while listening to music. Rob is surprised when he hears Rachel sing, and the voice sounds like the girl singing on the record. He then concludes that it was Rachel, and Rachel affirms this, saying that it was her singing during the good old days before the war. While cooking, they heard a car engine, so they hid quickly. It happened to be the police officer. Rachel and Rob wouldn't have shown themselves up, but because of the intrigue warning of the police, they showed up to ask what the police meant by what he said. Police officer Van Gain came to see them and warn them. They learn that evening from police officer Van Gain that Rachel is in the neighborhood and that the Nazis are looking for her. Soon the SD will come and arrest her for transport to Poland because chances are they will be put in jail for aiding Jews. Rachel then asks how this information reaches police officer Van Gain. In reply, Van Gain said that the police report of the Krauts landed in the hands of the Hague police. He consents to aid Rachel and Rob in escaping to the southern region of Holland that is governed by the Allies. Upon the police officer leaving, Rachel chases him to help her, and Rob goes into hiding. The police officer gives a secret route to escape through the Beisbosch. Rob hesitates to accept the help as it is too risky, but Van Gain gives them an option, to come with him or take care of themselves. Rachel said that they'll come, so Van gave them a time frame to prepare before picking them up the following day. First, Rachel goes to see Small, her father's attorney. He gives her enough cash and jewelry to last her for a year, but he also cautions her against putting too much faith in others. Van Gain takes Rob and Rachel to a port where Jews are waiting to depart. After her brother's emergency appendectomy, Rachel is reunited with her parents and sibling. Van Gain does not travel on the boat with the Jews. A Nazi patrol boat ambushes the boat that evening. Only Rachel escapes the bloodbath after the Nazis open fire. She observes the Nazis stealing from the dead as she floats downstream. Rachel is discovered by resistance members, who disguise her as a typhoid victim and sneak her into the Hague by putting her in a coffin that, although properly sealed, has significant air gaps. She is given the new name Ellis de Vries and transported to a soup kitchen run by another resistance member, Gerben Kuypers. She eventually becomes involved in the resistance's operations to sneak British weapons and food. Hans Ackermans, a skilled marksman, is in charge of the smugglers. To avoid having their train bags searched by the Nazis for weapons, he and Ellis must pretend to be husband and wife. However, a new strategy is required when it becomes evident that the Nazi soldiers aboard the train genuinely want to search all luggage. Ellis grabs the luggage and walks inside the private space where SD Colonel Munza is sitting. Munza's compartment isn't explored by the Nazis. Evidently drawn to one another, Munza accepts Ellis' invitation to join him at work. Hans is obviously envious. A truck carrying British weaponry in front of the soup kitchen is involved in an accident. Tim Kuyper, Kuyper's son, is stopped by the Gestapo while driving. Ella sets up a meeting with Munson in the hopes that she may convince him to free Tim while the others hide. 
she brings him some rare Dutch stamps knowing how much he loves collecting stamps. She receives an invitation to a Nazi party from him. She recognizes SS leader Gunnar Franken as the Nazi who organized the assault on the refugee boat when she sees him there. She is horrified at his sight, yet she still manages to sing at the celebration. Back in his suite, she and Munsa make love. He has fallen in love with her despite his suspicions that she is Jewish due to her blonde hair color. She agrees to work in his office and starts the next day. She meets Ronnie, Franken's assistant, and bedmate, there. Franken informs them that Tim has confessed to all charges and will be put to death, however, Munza declines to sign the death warrant. If the resistance stopped attacking the Nazis, the Nazis would prevent their violent retaliation against Dutch citizens, according to a ceasefire agreement that Small and Munza arranged. Ellis encounters Small at the Nazi headquarters and receives this information from him. However, a dispute among the resistance fighters develops when a covert microphone installed by Ellis in Franken's office shows that Franken and Van Gaen had been working together to kill and rob Jews attempting to flee into Allied territory. Van Gaen can ask Franken how he knows where the Jews are hiding, but Franken won't respond. Ellis seeks retribution for her family, but Kuypers won't take the chance of breaching the ceasefire for fear that his son will be murdered. When he queries if Jewish lives are any more significant than Dutch lives, he exhibits a degree of anti-Semitism. Hans and a few others decide, behind Kuiper's back, and make it appear as though he fled into hiding to defend himself. Van Gaen attempted to be drugged by Hans using chloroform. Still, the drug is no longer practical due to its expiration date. They are compelled to kill Van Gaen and throw his body in the canal as he comes dangerously close to escaping. The following evening, Munza confronts Ellis about her involvement with the resistance. From a friend at City Hall, Small obtains the blueprints for the Nazi headquarters, the structure was formerly a bank. A strategy is developed to enter the premises undetected during a party celebrating Hitler's birthday. Using information provided to him by Ellis, Munza charges Franken with the offense of keeping goods seized from Jews. When a search of Franken's safe turns up nothing, Franken accuses Munza of haggling with the resistance, a group of terrorists. Franken declares that the execution of 40 hostages will take place in vengeance for the murder of Van Gaen after Munza receives a death sentence. Ellis urges that Munza be one of those freed because she is in love with him, even though the rescue operation will now be more difficult. She invites Hans and the others to descend a coal chute that night before singing at the party. Many of the captives are released after the resistance members enter the structure. Then, though, Nazi forces ambush them. Hans and just one other resistance member are still alive. Franken brings Ellis to his office, where he uses the secret microphone, which he is aware of, to make it appear that Ellis has been working with him to undermine the resistance. Kuypers promises to murder her. However, Franken and Munza have already made this decision. That evening, as another sympathetic soldier frees Ellis and Munza from their cells, Ronnie uses her body as a distraction. A few days later, World War II, in Europe, ended with the German surrender. Back in The Hague, Ellis and Munza travel. They visit Small because they believe he is the one who tells Franken about the Jews and resistance soldiers. He disputes it and asserts that he has evidence of the actual offender, which he plans to present to the Canadian military authority in charge of the city. But before he can, Small and his wife are killed by an unidentified assassin. Even though Ellis removes Small's notebook, resistance fighters capture Munza and her. Franken makes a boat escape attempt with the stolen Jewish goods, but Hans shoots him. General Kotner, Munza's previous commanding officer, argues to his Canadian counterpart that Nazi officers still retain the power to punish their own officers for misconduct and sentences Munza to death while he is in possession of the Canadian army. For his interactions with communists in the resistance, Munza is put to death. Ellis is housed in a pen alongside other Dutch people suspected of working with the Nazis. Other locals treat Kate and her fellow inmates horribly. Still, Hans intervenes and chastises his compatriots for acting like their Nazi occupiers during the war. Hans finds Ellis and brings her to his office, where he is now revered as a resistance hero. They give out chocolate bars to children on the way. He shows her the money and valuables he took from Franken in his office and informs her that Munza was executed. Ellis bursts into tears. Hans claims to be giving her a sedative but injects her with a lethal dose of insulin. He is a resistance traitor and believes he must kill Ellis to clear his name. When Ellis goes to his window to accept the crowd's applause, he eats a chocolate bar to counteract the insulin and flees with Small's black book. 
she delivers the proof to Kuiper's at a neighboring mass grave where his son's recently discovered body. They depart in search of Hans, attempting to flee the city with the Jewish loot. Using the same strategy to get Rachel into the resistance, they locate him on a country road using the coffin with the screen vent. Kuipers and Ellis cut off his air supply despite his willingness to give them some of the money, allowing him to suffocate to death. They discuss how to use the money on the river's edge. The movie concludes in 1956, at the Kibbutz Stein, founded with Jewish money, when Rachel and her family disappear behind the fences as armed Israeli soldiers arrive to guard it against an unknown enemy, signaling the start of the Suez Crisis. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.